Hey scholars, this is a lecture video for chapter six on evidence and proof. Make sure you're referring to the PowerPoint presentation, which is available on the same module as where you found this video, the link for the video. Um, chapter six starts on page 106. So if you're following along your textbook, writing notes down and whatnot, that's where we're at. Um, this PowerPoint that, that I have, that I provided for you on our course page, I, I have a variety of notes in the notes pages, so hopefully those will be useful to you as you're going through them. So basically for this lecture video, I'm going to, in the PowerPoint, I'm gonna, gonna go through chapter six and talk about the different components of evidence and proof as, as I'm gonna highlight various aspects of that. But then I'm gonna provide a more detailed overview of, of just the overall nature of ethos, pathos, and logos. In other words, how do we utilize as, as, a, as a producer of a message, whether that's a written message, a spoken message, uh, like a speech or an argument that you're presenting to um, a jury or a, an argument that you're presenting to your friend or a speech that you're presenting to in this class for a grade, no matter what the situation is, the, the goal is, or the, the point is to understand the nature of ethos, pathos, and logos when it comes to persuading any kind of an audience. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go kind of a deep dive on that, going back to you know the the um, the Aristotelian notions from you know from Aristotle about about these three components of persuasion and rhetoric. Okay, so that first slide or slide two, um, you, I'm I'm sure you've probably heard people say things like the the things that the authors mentioned. Hey, trust me on this. Um, I know a guy who knows a guy who told him that, or I read somewhere that, or hey, studies show that, or hey, I guarantee it, right? Just trust me, I guarantee it. Well, there's not a whole lot of weight in that, right? Um, you can't just take someone's word for it without any evidence. It's like it's a it's a baseless way of of trying to propose an argument. I have that photo from some of you might remember that it's a it's a bit older, but um, that guy, his name is George Zimmer. Yeah, I think it's George Zimmer. And he was the CEO owner or whatever of, of the uh, company called Men's Warehouse. And his tagline was, you're going to you're gonna like the way you look, I guarantee it. And that was his thing. He's like, I guarantee it. Just trust me. You're going to like the way you look. Um, and and I, I don't know how successful that was. I mean, the company is successful, but was that success based on that, that line of, I guarantee it? He kind of he didn't coin that phrase, but he definitely capitalized on that phrase. That was his tagline or the company's tagline. I guarantee it. And and I mentioned that because it works. Doesn't it doesn't mean that that you're gonna like the way you look. It doesn't mean that if someone says I guarantee it, it doesn't mean that it's true. I'm just saying what works is that we as a human, as a consumer of messages, we respond to that. That they're important. They seem smart and they're saying, I guarantee it. Well, if they're guaranteeing it, then it must be true. Um, in some cases, it might be true, but it's it's not it's not a, a good form of an argument. Um, anyhow, didn't didn't stop the success of the company. Okay, so let's go to that first one on on source credibility slide three. So source credibility, who's who says who says so? So, so the authors talk about the the degree to which you really want to to scrutinize the source of any particular message, and and we're talking about the person. Um, how can we really trust the person? Are they an authoritative, authoritative source for the thing that they're talking about? Like, how do we really know that what this person is saying on TV, in the newspaper, or whatever, in a book? How do how can we trust the person? So, um, hopefully, I'm, I've said this throughout the semester, but hopefully, you learn how to engage and practice uh, reasonable skepticism. You don't want to just you know read through this chapter and read through the PowerPoint and then finish this course and then always be questioning people like. How can I really trust you? It's like, because I'm your dad, you know, or because I'm your medical doctor and I'm telling you, you have an infection. Well, how do I know? It's like, you know, you got to take things, uh, you got to be reasonable with, with how you apply this stuff. Next one, who, who's who? Is the source known? Um, sometimes I, I'll hear people talking about things, about, about things that they read or they heard. And, and the question that I ask, maybe not in these words, is do, do you even know where that information came from? Um, how do we, like how do you even know that the accuracy of what you're talking about if you don't even know where the information come from, so where the information came from so it's very important to know your uh, to know your source the authors talk about all different types of, of ways um, to to 
to, to scrutinize a source. Um, a known source, you know, a, a well-known person might, might be a good, a, a good way, to, a good word, good place to start. But a known source is not necessarily a qualified source just because someone is, is known and, and maybe well-liked and maybe they're, they have expertise on some things. I have expertise on a variety of topics. And so maybe I, let's just say hypothetically, I had a community of people who knew me to be ex to have expertise in various things. But does that mean I can speak on other things that are unrelated to it? I mean, you know me, right? So, but am I, am I a qualified person to talk about this thing? Another one I want to mention and highlight is this, the scholarly referee journal articles. As you see, it's the, the gold standard. So the, the, the reason why I emphasize this so much is because that is like the basis of most of your textbooks or the majority of your textbooks, at least in the social sciences and, and whatnot, sociology, philosophy, political science, argumentation, everything in communication, psych, um, social psychology, all that kind of stuff. The reason why a scholarly peer reviewed journal article is so challenging is because of the process and the rejection rate. If I want to get something published in a journal article, I have to submit a manuscript to the journal and then it's looked at by, by peers, other college professors or um, people, it's generally college professors. And then there is a, um, the editor of the actual journal, the actual journal. So in order for something to be published, all there's there's three reviewers and they all look at it and they'll say we accept it or we reject it if we reject it then they might say you can't have it at all we're not going to publish it here or we'll we'll say let's revise some things and then resubmit it ultimately the editor has the final say um i won't get into too much detail about how those things work but the point is for something to be actually published in a scholarly journal it, it, it stands to reason. And the thing that you can take away from this is, is you know that it's, that it's gone through a whole, um, uh, a, a very scrutinizing process. So it, that doesn't necessarily mean it's good, but that's the gold standard for, for, for good information. Um, it's usually really good. Usually scholarly peer reviewed journal articles are, are pretty dense and meaty and accurate and all that kind of stuff. All right. Um, Source bias. So a lot of times, I mean, it's 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 inevitable that we're going to be biased about things. I mean, to a degree, everyone's biased about some things. And, and so when it comes to um, trusting a source, trusting evidence, you have to overcome source bias. And one of the ways you can overcome source bias is by um, engaging in perspective taking, self-awareness, self-monitoring. Am I Am I being, am I, am I push, pushing a personal agenda? Am I allowing my personal interests and my personal convictions? Am I allowing that to guide my decision-making in terms of uh, what I report, if I'm, a, if I'm a reporter, what I report or how I consume information? So it's important to be very aware of, of your own personal background, your personal biases and, and how that might sort of go in conflict with, with any kind of evidence that you're talking about. One thing is do things differently. Um, one of the things the authors talk about is is to have a have a diversity of, of where you get your news. If it's all if it's always your social media feed, if you have the same social media feeds, there's obviously um, most most of you know this, but there are there are algorithms that you know when you when you read certain articles, you share articles, you like articles, all that kind of stuff. There's all kinds of algorithms within your uh, social media apps and other kinds of apps that will s systematically present you with information to continue feeding you the things that are making you, um, you know, be swayed in one particular direction or another. And some of you might say, well, is that inherently bad? Well, not necessarily, but it's going to, it's going to systematically enhance the degree to which you're biased towards all types of news sources. So, Hey, social media, NPR, CNN, Fox, uh, BBC, just get get a uh, you know the newspaper, get just a variety of diversity of sources as much as possible from getting getting information on a topic from as many different sources as possible and to, to see where they overlap, to see where they differ and whatnot. Uh, context is key, um, you know, to, to really understand uh, the the nature of something, you have to you have to get the 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 bigger picture. My, my Spanish teacher in high school or in college, she always said, or, uh, she always said, depende de contexto, depende de contexto, right? So it depends on the context. If you want to understand something, you have to know the context. So the, the authors talk about that thing on six figure six, four, um, 
Joe, uh, Joe, whoever Joe Scarborough is, he said, it will not, he was quoting Ben Carson from something, he said, it will not be my intention to do anything to, benef to benefit any American. Now, if you just read that sentence out of context, that sounds pretty negative. It sounds like, according to that, it sounds like Ben Carson, it sounds like what he means is um, he doesn't want to benefit any American, right? Because that's what it says. But if you don't, if you don't know the context of what of what's that said, if you don't know the, ver the 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 words and sentences that came before that and or after that, well, then you don't have the meaning. Meaning is not in words. Meaning is not necessarily in language. Meaning is in here. Meaning it, meaning is inside of us, right? And I have to use words and language to to try to achieve some level of shared meaning. You can't just if you know if, if if that wasn't the case if that wasn't necessary then I could just take my thoughts and transfer them from my brain to your brain and then we don't need to talk, but we have to talk. We have to use words to get me to to achieve meaning. And even then, it's it sometimes is um, oftentimes is not a hundred percent accurate. Re research shows that in many cases our perceptual accuracy of other people's messages. Let's say you and let's say you and I are having a conversation, right? And I'm explaining something to you. Um, or let's say you're explaining something to me. You're explaining your position on something to me. Let's say it's a political position, a, a hot topic issue, or some sort of like art, right? Maybe you're an artist and you're, you're talking about how the, what, what this art means and, and whatnot. And I'm, and I'm following, I'm tracking, right? And I'm like, so let me see if I have this correct. And then I repeat it back to you. You might say, in a matter of words, you know, you might say that's about 70% accurate. Um, and it's not that I did something wrong or you did something wrong. The nature of meaning is is complex. Anyways, that's that's a lot more than you need to know for this particular section on context. The point is context is key. You could have a grain of salt approach, apply reasonable skepticism um, when when analyzing evidence, testing evidence, and then there's suppressed uh, suppressed evidence, which is withholding information, um, with, withholding evidence in let's say a, a court case. The authors mentioned the tobacco company. But just just so, just so you know, withholding information is a form of deception. It's not the same thing as lying. Um, if if you really want to know about deception, then read about deception. But deception is a very very broad topic, and there's several components and there's several factors within deception. One form of deception is withholding information systematically, like intentionally. The reason why that's de deception is that it's it's misrepresenting the truth. If I know that hey, if, if I'm if I'm withholding this piece of information. On some level, I'm misrepresenting the truth of the matter. In some cases, that might be very innocuous. In other cases, it's very severe and toxic, as in the as in the example of the film The Insider. So I have a clip from The Insider. If you want to click on that link on the um, uh, slide three, if you click on that link on slide three, it'll take you to to a scene where um, one of the attorneys is trying to 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 get information from Jeffrey Wigand. By the way, this is a film based on a true story. Look it up on your own time if you want. But the the, the big the big picture the big picture here is the tobacco company the tobacco company was withholding information. Jeffrey Wigand found out about it. He became the whistleblower for the company Brown and Levinson. And then as a result of that, a lot of crazy stuff was happening and um and it led to this court case and and whatnot. But I'm, I sh I'm sharing the clip with you to see the outcome. This this is one of the many potential outcomes that can happen with suppressed evidence, right? Um, okay, so that's that. On to slide four. Another test of uh, evidence is, is irrelevant. Relevance. Um, the evidence does not speak for itself. So whatever you're talking about, you need to explain. The, an arguer must explain the relevance of evidence presented. And and because if you present evidence and it's not that if it doesn't seem related to the issue at hand to the to the topic to the argument, if if it doesn't sound like it is, then it doesn't mean that it isn't. But nevertheless, the point is, as the arguer, as the one who's creating the evidence, or you found the evidence and you're presenting it, you have to explain it. Imagine that your doctor says the evidence speaks for itself, right? You go to your doctor because you're having some sort of a medical complication. And they do all kinds of tests and your doctor just shows you the, the test results, the, the statistics of your test results. And your doctor says, well, here's the results. And you're looking at it and you're like, well, what does it all mean? Imagine your doctor says, the evidence speaks for itself. Now, getting aside, um, that's, that's, uh, 
a, a, a bit of a bit of a stretch, but the point is the evidence evidence does not speak for itself. It has to be um, explained, and even then, even when you explain it, you're only you're only achieving a certain level of of full understanding. And then reliability, the reliability of the evidence, right? Uh, the, the authors use the example of a scale. If you were to step on your scale every morning, if one morning it says uh, you know 150, the next morning it says 180, the next morning it says 220, the next morning it says 100, it's not reliable, right? It's not very reliable. If if you step on the scale every morning and let's say it's 180, 181, 179. 185. You know, if it's always ranging between a certain, if, if it's always weighing in at a certain range, then you can might you might say that it's reliable, um, because it's it's consistently hitting that mark. But if it's all over the place, then it's not reliable. Remember the game of telephone, right? So you're you're hearing some evidence, you're hearing a, a story. One question is kind of like the whole um, source bias is, well, how how reliable is this information? How accurate is it? How many different people has it gone through before it, it got to me? It went from, you know, the, the the person on the street who talked to the reporter, the reporter talked to the the uh, government official, the government official talked to someone else, and then it went to a news station and so on and so forth, and it finally went to your social media feed. Um, is that how how reliable is it? Like how likely is it that that one or more of the facts or details of, of the issue was either forgotten or mismanaged or misrepresented, et cetera. So um, something to consider. And then the authors talk about statistical proof. And the authors mention how statistics can be made to prove anything, or that's what some people think. Uh, statistics can't necessarily be made to prove anything, although in a way they can, right? Uh, if you're familiar with the nature of statistical um, of, of quantitative research methods and statistics, then then you know the, the process, which is in part uh, an issue of, of ethics and and um, honesty and, and integrity and whatnot. In other words, if I'm the researcher doing doing all the data, data collection, data analysis, data cleaning, hey, I can easily fudge some things. I can easily make I can easily tell a story that's not quite accurate because and maybe the reason why I'm telling a particular story is because it makes my story look better or I'm I'm biased in, in what I want to find. I, I'm biased in what I want the research to show and I can statistic or systematically manipulate the, the the numbers so that way it'll 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 show on the report. Um, I don't know how often that happens, but just so you know, like if that were in your, if, if, if you were submitting a manuscript to a journal, a peer reviewed journal, um, and you manipulated a bunch of numbers, you, you could get caught, right? It's, it's possible that you could get, you could get caught and, and whatnot. And then your journal wouldn't be published, your manuscript wouldn't be published. And then your, your integrity might be called into to question and whatnot. And then there's the, the, the wild ass guess, the wag, right? So sometimes people just make things up. Like I have no idea. They'll, you're at, you might be asked a question and, and, and in, your, in, your, in the back of your mind, you're thinking, I, I don't know the answer to this. And you just make something up. Most people have done it. You've probably done that before. Um, and then there's things that are just unknowable, unknowable statistics. Uh, so when people are talking about things and you're like, well, how, how would you even gather that data, that information? Some things you just can't know or you can't know well. Um, survey demographics, it's important to know the, the details. If, if you're reading the, uh, the outcomes of a poll of a survey, you should know how they gathered that information. What was their audience? Was it a, as a, was it a, um, a, an accurate representation, a diverse um, representation of everyone in the United States, or was it just everyone who's in one, you know, one um, way of thinking? That would definitely sway, sway the, um, um, that's the word I'm looking for. It's just, it's, it's a, it's, it's biased evidence. It's biased information. And then keeping the, number, the numbers in perspective. So sometimes here's the thing you hear, a, you hear a scary statistics. You hear something that this just strikes fear in you about a, a case of a person getting attacked by a shark. Hey, I, I got a fear of sharks. I, and I know it's a, it's a rational fear. I, it's a, there's a, there's a real reason to be afraid of a shark, but in some ways it's, irrational because the likelihood of ever getting attacked by a shark, let alone being killed by a shark, is highly, highly, highly unlikely and much more likely to get in a car accident. And in, uh, uh, let's see, how many years? 25 years of driving, I've only been in two accidents, right? Um, I'm much more likely to get another accident 
over the next you know several years before getting attacked by a shark. They, they mentioned peanut allergies, mad cow disease. You might not be old enough, but maybe maybe you are. But back in the day, there was a, a huge scare of mad cow disease. And what the authors mentioned is that no one no one has died. No one in the U.S. has died from mad, mad cow disease. But man, I remember back when it came out. It was all over the news and people were scared and and they were showing the the images of cows and they were showing like all kinds of horrible things that were happening but but the the fact of the matter is it, it wasn't really in perspective the numbers weren't in perspective so just because you hear a scary statistic doesn't mean that you're really that susceptible to it maybe you are but as one person said um an economist said if we want to fear something we should fear cheeseburgers and the sun and whatnot. And I've already mentioned this before. People fear the things that they don't need to fear and they don't fear the things they should fear. Okay, so that's that's a lot on um, evidence. I'm gonna move on to the, the, the section on ethos, pathos, and logos. So when it comes to evidence, when you're when you're looking at evidence to support an argument, I'm not saying I'm not saying, hey, just assume that it's false. I'm saying before you accept it as true, before you accept it as accurate, before you actually apply that to your life, before you go on sharing that evidence with other people, you can, you know, pause, take a little, little T.O. and say like, hmm, if there's part of you that's saying this doesn't sound right, you know, it doesn't mean that it's not right. But if it, if it doesn't sound right, hey, there's all kinds of ways to, to really weigh that evidence. And even if it does sound right, just because something sounds right doesn't mean that it is. But but hopefully after this course, after reading through this book and completing this course, you have a sort of a, a keener eye and ear, so to speak, for um, the way the the way that you accept evidence as being truthful or not, or accurate or not, or reliable or not. Okay, moving on to ethos, pathos, and logos. So as, as a producer of a message, um, there's three components to, to producing a very effective persuasive message, ethos, pathos, and logos. So I want to talk about those in detail. So this is most of this is is not going to be in your textbook. I mean, there's there's elements of um, these components that are in your book, but this is a specific uh, a specific message on ethos, pathos, and logos. So ethos is, is is also known as credibility. A person's credibility. Another way to think about credibility is believability. Um, if someone's credible, they're believable. And if so, if I'm credible, that means I'm believable. That means that you're more likely to do the things that I tell you to do. Like, why, why wouldn't you do what I tell you to do? If you believe me, if I have a high level of credibility, if, if, um, if, you, if you have a lot of credibility and you're very believable and you tell me something, I'll probably think it's true. If you say I should do something, I'm, I'm more likely to do it because you have that credibility. So what is credibility? What, uh, how does it work? There's, there's two types. There's extrinsic and intrinsic. So extrinsic credibility is the credibility that you might possess prior to your message. Not everyone has this, but I, but but you all understand it because of you know reading books or seeing movies or watching TV shows, etc. Extrinsic extrinsic credibility is also known as initial credibility. It's what you have before you even begin talking. Or another way to think about it is inherited ethos. So um, let's say look 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 at that uh, uh, slide nine. Um, if you were about to hear a message on someone like Steven Spielberg or Beyonce, and, and they were going to talk about their their levels of expertise, their the things that they know a lot about, or the TED talk on how how can we starve, can we eat to starve cancer? Someone with several years of research and expertise and experience in the medical field, those people they have extrinsic credibility, they have inherited ethos because of all their work, because of their background, they've inherited that. Because of Beyonce's career in the music industry, she has that inherited ethos, right? Um, in other words, if she were to, if if she were going to give a, a talk on something related to the music industry, before she begins her talk, before she opens her mouth, most of the people in the audience can rightfully give her that extrinsic credibility. So credibility is something that is given by the audience to the speaker or to the producer of the message. So the audience is doing that for Beyonce, like, okay, she's gonna. You know, she's going to talk about something. She already has the reputation, right? She already has the, the background. So I'm more likely to just respond to what she's saying. I'm less likely to question what she's saying because she's got she's got that experience. Um, 
ethos is the capacity to influence an audience based on the audience's perceptions of the credibility and character of the speaker in relationship to its own interests and values. That's slide eight. So that's a very detailed explanation of ethos. Um, so the effectiveness of your speech or your message is much as much is uh, very much a function of, of, of how the audience perceives your character. Um, spe giving a speech is something that can be very personal. So the more that you perceive a message is sort of appealing to things like your values, commitment, integrity, or like things like integrity, sensitivity, partnership, um, collaboration, honesty. There's certain things that, that you hold near and dear to your life, certain values that you hold, whether it's a personal thing or business thing or religious thing or whatever. But when you start perceiving that the speaker has those, had also has those things on, on his or her mind, your trust meter starts to go up, right? Your trust meter goes high. Like the more that I think that we're on the same page, the more likely I am to trust you. So that's another way of understanding ethos, a definite, a detailed definition of ethos. Okay, on to slide 10. Slide 10 is is uh, intrinsic, um, intrinsic credibility. So if you don't have extrinsic credibility, if you don't have inherited ethos, that's okay. Most college students are in, are in that, um, are in that field, right? Like I don't have expertise on this topic. I did research on it. It's interesting to me, but I don't have 20 years experience of, of whatever the topic is. That's okay. Um, you can still get credibility from the audience by doing things like um, through channels such as your appearance, the way you have an introduction, the, the overall organization of your points, your argument, things like delivery. Uh, I have all this stuff in my notes. So intrinsic credibility is also known as demonstrated or derived credibility. When I first walk up to the audience, when I first walk up to the podium, if you don't know me, um, you don't have any reason to give me credibility. I haven't said anything yet. So I, I don't have, I don't yet have credibility for my audience. So let's say slide, you know, slide 11, you're a college student giving a speech in a classroom. Um, let's say you're giving a presentation to a group of your peers in a boardroom, or you're pitching an idea, you're, you're, you're giving some sort of a sales pitch you're trying to acquire a new client, right? And you're in a room full of people, they don't know you that well. Maybe you have the credibility, um, uh, but maybe they don't know you. Maybe maybe, maybe you don't have the, the same kind of experience as, as they're used to. You can still demonstrate to them that you deserve it through a, a detailed explanation, through a well-organized presentation, or let's say a new manager on the job. You see the manager on the job, let's, let's assume that he's a manager and, and you're, you're you're trying to get, you're trying to get get your people to like you right there's a, a there's a number of things that you can do to gain that credibility you can demonstrate to your new um, subordinates that that you deserve um, that credibility through friendliness through no demonstrating how you know your your company your material etc so there's a variety of ways that you can gain credibility let's move on to pathos on uh, slide 12. so pathos persuades by producing an emotional response in an audience that makes it favorable to one thing and unfavorable to another. So a lot of times when we're about to make a decision, if we're going to vote for someone, if we're going to make a major change, if we're going to um, agree or disagree with an argument, sometimes we we see what where our feelings are leading us. We Our feelings can sometimes be useful, but oftentimes they can be misleading because if I'm just relying on my emotions and my feelings, then then it's more of a, of a gamble. Um, because it's, it's easy. It can be easy to produce a, an emotional response in an audience through, 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 through strategic communication. Um, I'm not going to edit this stuff. So on to slide 13. Emotional appeals can be persuasive and generate all kinds of emotional responses, both positive and negative. Sometimes you want to generate um, negative emotions. You want people to, to understand something like, uh, fear or anger, right? Uh, business leaders who are unethical, landlords who exploit student tenants, the rising cost of healthcare, inequality with our justice system, et cetera, et cetera. You might want your audience to, to, to experience anger, to experience, like let's say, righteous anger, assuming that you're presenting good evidence, but you can do that through your facial expressions, or even if, you're, if, if it's not your face, you can do that through your language, through things like imagery, et cetera. Um, but the inverse of that is true as well. You can you can generate very positive emotions like pride in your country, family, school, ethnic heritage, etc. There's a variety of things that you can do to, to generate these positive emotions. 
Emotions are powerful. And that's why I emphasize it so much. Um, according to Crick, slide 14, emotions are what make judgments possible by giving us the motive to prefer one thing over another. So they, they guide in our decision making. They, they guide us in our decision making process, sometimes for the good and sometimes not for the good. Um, but but they're real, right? And they're, and they're powerful. And if you've ever made a decision based on an emotion and then you later regret it, you realize like, man, that was, it was, it was so, it was so, um, so significant how I made that major huge decision because of a feeling. My grandma was a very compulsive decision maker. She got married. She, she, she married her husband, um, within two weeks of meeting him back in the, this would have been back in the, I think the forties, um, early, early, mid forties. My, my grandma met him. And then within two weeks, she didn't know anything about him. They got married. My grandma was also at a, she was out, she was at a, a car dealership once with her daughter and her husband, not my mom, my mom's sister, my aunt. So my grandma was with them, at the car dealership. And while my aunt and uncle were, were doing the paperwork, they, they're, they're like, where's, where's my mom? Where's mom? And like, I don't know. And then all of a sudden, my grandma comes running up to them with a set of keys in her hand. And she said, I bought a new car. And she was all happy and giddy. And, and they were like, wait, what? You didn't need a car. You just came with us for, you know, cause you were just our company or the ride or something like that. <clears throat> what had happened was my grandma was looking at cars. She was like, just looking at cars as, as she was waiting for her daughter. And a, a salesperson saw her and unfortunately took advantage of her that's that's my my understanding is that she was taken advantage of because she didn't need a car her car was fine but people like that who are very impulsive when it comes to decision making for big decisions oftentimes they're they're led by their emotions that can be good or it can be really bad in my grandma's case it was bad she bought a car she didn't need she had to sell her other car the car she bought it was a lemon. She had nothing but trouble with it. Not, not that it's, it's not like she had trouble with the car because it was an impulsive decision. It was just an unintended consequence of an impulsive decision. Motions are powerful. So back on or uh, back to the sli uh, flat PowerPoint slide onto logos. Slide 15. Logos refers to the use of rational arguments and evidence to persuade an audience of the reasonableness of one's position. Now this should sound like major review, right? These are all terms that, that we've already covered before. Reasonableness. Your goal is to convince the audience that your argument is reasonable. Slide 16. So that's one of what's one of the main things in this course and argumentation. One, one of your main goals is to convince your audience that your re, that your argument, whatever it is, is reasonable. And there's a lot of ways that you can achieve that. How do you achieve reasonableness, which is a word I think I just made up. Um, slide 17. It's, it's, it's good to know that humans make rational decisions. Humans have a, a very large, a very significant past, uh, significant capacity for understanding the difference between rational thinking, rational decision-making and irrational decision-making. I have the picture of the tea party with the two girls, picture of a tea party to illustrate the fact that even from a very young age, that's what I noticed with my kids. My kids are four and six. My daughter's six, my son is four. When you think about it, a tea party is irrational. It doesn't make any sense. There's no tea in there. They're not drinking it. That's not rational behavior, but it is. It's it, the way that I describe it is it's, it's functional. It's functionally irrational behavior. It's play. It's fun, right? It's make believe it's, it's creativity, but there's no, there's, there's nothing actually happening. They're not actually drinking out of the cup, but they know that the kids know that they know that they know it's pretend. They know the difference between rational thinking and irrational thinking. Um, anyhow, my point is we, we understand the, the, the notion of uh, humans understand the notion of rational thinking from a very, very early age. It's in our DNA. It's how we're made, etc. And it's important to know that the audience draws conclusions based on your evidence. Try to avoid thinking that you have to prove your argument, no matter how good your argument is. Some people just won't accept it. And, and sometimes you'll never know why they don't accept it. They just don't. But um, a human can draw conclusions based on evidence. They don't, they don't have to have expertise, knowledge. Anybody can draw a conclusion for the most part. Some people have a, are, are more adept at that. Some people have a more systematic approach for drawing conclusions. But we, the, the, the point is as a human, I can listen to a message. I can listen to evidence and I can make a decision based on that. Maybe I don't understand it all, 
but nevertheless, it's it's something that we do. Um, so when you're using evidence to support your argument, make sure it comes from reputable sources, journals, newspapers, experts, etc. cetera, uh, slide 19, slide 20. And you wanna be really strategic uh, in terms of how you incorporate that evidence into your message. You don't, you're not just gonna say, you're not just gonna start a speech or a paper or an article or an argument by saying, I'm gonna start by listing all my evidence and then I'm gonna to get to everything else. It's like, no, you, you strategically weave that evidence into your argument so as to create a very compelling message, whether it's a conversation or report or whatever. Um, sometimes people don't, they don't, they don't, uh, they don't, they might not believe you. Maybe, maybe it's a personal thing where if it's my brother or if it's someone who knows me really well, maybe they don't want to take my word for it just because they don't, you know, maybe they don't like me or something like that. But whatever the case may be, you can always defer to experts, right? Extrinsic credibility. Maybe, maybe I don't have that uh, extrinsic credibility, but other people do. So when I'm using evidence to support my argument, I strategically incorporate that into my message by deferring to the industry experts like Steven Spielberg or um, uh, Beyonce or Dr. William Lee. That's the other guys up there. Slide 22. Strong evidence make your, makes your message more credible, more believable. So the, the more compelling, the stronger, the more robust your evidence is, the more likely the audience will accept it. The more likely you'll get more credibility, more believability, etc. I mentioned the this, I, I show this picture of, of T. Colin Campbell. Um, he's the one who wrote a book called, he and many people contributed to writing a book called The China Study. He's, he's uh, one of the featured persons in the documentary film called Forks Over Knives. I talked about this issue with my dad having cancer. I talked about it in, in another lecture video. Um, so that's what I did. I, I was using, when I was talking to my dad about this, about how important it is to, to consider m modifying his, his diet. He, my, at one point my dad said, Hey, do you really think this? He said, Hey, Johnny, you really think this is going to work? And I'm like, well, it's not what I think. It's not that I think it's going to work, but here's what the, here's what the evidence shows. And, uh, and then I deferred to someone like him. And, and similar evidence. Um, the stronger your mess, the stronger your evidence, the better. It's important to be realistic, though. Slide twenty-three. Uh, people are stubborn. Um, some people, no, no matter no matter how good your evidence, no matter how good your argument is, some people are stubborn, unpredictable, and intractable. Despite the best efforts of persuaders, no matter what you do, in some cases, when when it comes to trying to get your kid to eat, uh, whether it's broccoli or vegetables or anything, or to do anything. No matter what I say or how I say it, they just won't budge, right? Because they're kids. Um, as they get older, things will be different, but that's just the nature of, of human behavior. So I, I like the expression, and I'm pretty sure I've talked about it before, but it's a good refresher. The gustibus non est be tandem, slide 25. In matters of taste, there can be no disputes. So the whole ice cream flavor thing. Um, if your favorite flavor of ice cream is chocolate, and I try to persuade you that it should be, uh, you know, green tea or pistachio or anything else. No, no matter how hard I try, no matter how much evidence I present, no matter how many different taste tests that I give you of other ice creams that I think are that should be better than your favorite chocolate. At the end of the day, you might say, you know what, I like chocolate. When matters of taste, there can be no disputes. You can't change my mind about that. It's it's not it's not you. It's that's just what I like. There's nothing you can do or say to make me change my mind, right? So it's a, it's, a, it's a bit over exaggerated, but hopefully you you get the idea. Um, so on to slide 26, we're all, we're kind of wrapping things up to for this. Um, I'm emphasizing that the whole point of realistic persuasion. One of the issue, one of the terms that we use for that is called practicality. So practicality is a a um, a concept that you have to work out in your in your speech. So all of you in here will actually give a persuasive speech, a, a, a problem solution speech. You're you're discussing a problem and then providing the solution. But within that solution step, within that the section on on the solution, um, you might have great evidence. You have a great plan, but is it practical? Maybe it's well thought out, but 
will it actually solve the problem or will it create new and more serious problems? If I talked about, let's say, uh, I wanna fix the, the student parking lot problem or the student parking problem. This is one that I talk about in the class a lot. Everyone gets it. Um, if I said, okay, here's how we fix the problem. We just, we, we, we tear down all the existing parking lots and then we build a new one. It's gonna cost all students an extra, you know, a couple thousand dollars a year. And then, um, you know, by the time you graduate, it'll still be under construction. But at some point, it's all going to be good. Well, okay, that that sounds like maybe that's a good idea, but that doesn't sound, that doesn't sound practical. Um, based on what I'm hearing, there's going to be all these other problems that that are making the, the current status quo, would make the current status quo worse. So you have to address the issue of practicality. So I have a, a, a funny illustration, in my opinion, it's funny. Um, there was an episode of The Cosby Show where Theo brought this a shirt. He, he, he went to the mall and, and he bought a shirt called a, a Gordon, I think it was like Gordon Cantrell or Gordon Cartrell shirt. It's like a, a, a name brand designer shirt. And, and he went to the mall and he bought this shirt for like a hundred bucks because he wanted to wear it to the dance and he wanted to look good. He wanted to feel good, right? He comes home. He's like, look at my shirt. And then his sister, Denise, says, oh, my gosh, Theo, hey, I'll, I'll make you that shirt. Take that shirt back to the mall. Get your money back. All I need is like 30 bucks for supplies, and, and I'll make you the exact, I'll make you a replica of that shirt. It'll look just as good and save you a ton of money. At the time, Denise was, had been um, taking up sewing or something like that, and, and she was trying to help her brother out, right? She had good intentions. <clears throat> Sometimes we have good intentions and sometimes we try to persuade people to do things and they do and then they comply with our requests. But in, in reality, it's very impractical. So um, I, the, the clip, I have the link for the clip. It's really funny. It's less than a minute long. In the clip, you see the point at which Denise and um, uh, her sister are in their room. I'm trying to think of her sister's name. Anyways. Denise and her sister are in her room and Theo is downstairs trying on the shirt and Denise knows it didn't come out right. She, she knows it looks bad right? because she, she finally made it and she looked at it and she's probably like, oh my gosh, it looks, looks horrible. And then Theo goes down to, to try it on and then and she's in her room and she's like, oh my gosh. And then he tries it on and he's like, Denise! And he <laughs> walks upstairs and then you can see how frustrated and how angry he is with the shirt that she made and, and she knows she's not denying it. She's like, I'm sorry, like you don't like it and, and whatnot. And and all that to say, all kidding aside, it's 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 humorous. It's a humorous illustration, but it really emphasizes a very practical point, which I'm guessing most of you have have experienced this on some level where maybe you've either been the persuader or the persuadee where you've you 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 had good intentions, you had a good idea, you persuaded someone to do something or not to do something. And then and it just came to to just really bite you, right? It just came to really um, the the plan was 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 foiled, right? It was not realistic. It was not practical. And in Theo's case, it like uh, uh, Denise's solution created new and more serious problems because one, that's a waste of thirty bucks that he gave her, right? Because he can't wear the shirt. And two, now now he's gonna feel that embarrassment or frustration or anger or whatever when he goes to the dance not a good way to start the dance, right? So um, good intentions don't always lead to good outcomes. So that's why you have to really be, you have to be very, uh, very much like scrutinizing what you're doing. Um, you might have a good idea for a solution for something, but make sure it's practical. And I, the reason why I emphasize this so heavily is because what I've seen in the, in the last 15 years of teaching college for persuasion speeches or for students developing arguments where it's a problem solution kind of argument, Often what I see is, hey, the solution sounds great, but it's not practical, right? You you didn't you didn't test to see if it actually works. Um, so there's a variety of ways that you can you can Ill, that you can um, deal with the issue of practicality within your argument within your speech. I'll have more information on that in, in the future, but but just know like that's that the, the the bottom line is like your solution has to be reasonable and practical. Okay. So just to, just to review ethos, pathos, and logos, making a personal connection, generating emotional appeal to guide the decision-making process, and then, hey, now that you've given me credibility and I've and I've gotten to your emotions a little bit in a in a 
in a positive pro-social way, in a um, ethical way. Um, now I'm telling you what to do. I, I'm using evidence and rational explanations to support my argument, whatever the case may be. And it's practical and it makes sense, right? It's realistic and and the situation or the, the, the ideas would make the situation better, not worse. So that's, that's everything. It's a lot. We covered a lot. So I have this other slide on um, Joaquin Phoenix's Oscar speech. He, he gave his Oscar speech for Joker. This is not a necessarily a homework assignment, but I recommend uh, you don't you don't have to do this. You're not going to turn anything in to um, to Canvas, but to really understand how all this stuff ties in, I highly recommend that you watch his speech. You, you probably heard it, be, you probably read it before. I'm sorry, you probably watched it before, but let's just you know I recommend watching it again. And and you don't have to write anything down, but it, at least watch the speech and and try to answer these questions at least do it in your head at least do it mentally but i recommend typing it out writing things down who's the target audience what's the what's the speech persuading um what is he trying to get people to do or not to do how is it tied to his role of, of playing the joker if you've seen the film um to what degree is credibility exemplified in his speech how, how is it in extrinsic or intrinsic how is pathos utilized there's not one right question for any of these but this is a way to to test your knowledge of, of the stuff that you read in the chapter and of course what's in this PowerPoint. And then how is he using logos to advance his argument? Were, were his re requests reasonable? What were his requests? What, is he, what do you think that he was trying to get the audience to do? What was his big message? Was it practical? And as they think of the cows, because he, he mentions cows and, and dairy, the dairy industry, and within that conversation, within that dialogue, within his speech, he mentions some requests. He's trying to get the audience to do something, to think a certain way. My question to you, is it practical? If you say yes, how so? Or how is it how is it practical? How is it impractical? So I hope you watch the speech and I hope you at least go through these questions and try to grapple with them a little bit as it's uh it's gonna enhance your understanding of how all these things, you know, tie in. I recommend watching the speech a few times. I've watched the speech probably twenty times just to for, for teaching purposes and to understand it better, to understand how how these elements are are exemplified in a real life, you know, uh, situation. I hope you're all doing great. That is it for this PowerPoint lecture video. I'll talk to you later.